Hey, good morning, everybody. Go ahead and stand to your feet with us this morning. We're about ready to dive in with some worship. We're so excited to worship with you. And let's go ahead and pray. Let's welcome God's presence in this room. God, we just welcome you here. God, we thank you for your presence. God, we want you here, Father. You are welcome in this room. You are welcome, Lord. Have your way today. Come on. I know some of us, maybe we've got a lot on our minds or weighing heavy on our hearts. Let's just start this worship set by just surrendering that to him. Right now, God, we just surrender to you, Lord. We surrender any thoughts that don't line up with your word. God, any negativity we may have carried in here, any doubt, Father, we give it to you, Lord. Move today, Father. Swing wide, swing wide, 
thank you this morning God for your goodness for your faithfulness God that we get to come together and worship you God we know sometimes in this world it can just seem like we're surrounded by so much evil and so much hurt and hate father and so this morning we ask that you would just shift our focus to your presence God we know that in your presence there is fullness of joy and so this morning, maybe if we feel like we're lacking in joy, lacking in peace, we know where to find that. So God, we just thank you for that today. Overwhelm our hearts right now with your peace, with your joy, with hope. God, real hope that only comes from you, Lord.
say show us second it says chains fall fear bow here now and I love it just declares Jesus come on just say his name say Jesus Jesus we know we can call out to you we know that when we're in distress we know that when things just seem to be pure chaos and we're afraid and we're scared we can say Jesus come on say Jesus you change everything you change my life so we're gonna declare this part fear has to bow I know it's hard. It's hard to not fall into that trap of just being afraid of anxiety and just fearfulness. But right now we're going to declare against that. We're going to use the authority that Jesus has given us. And we're going to say, fear, you have to bow. We're not going to carry a spirit of fear out of here today. We're going to leave it. Come on, let's sing that. Chains fall. In chains. Yeah. up some praise to him. God, you're worthy. Come on, tell him that. Say you're worthy. You're worthy, Father, of all praise. Thank you, Lord. So good. God, that's our prayer today. God, that you would just show us your glory. Reveal yourself in a new way, Father. Bring us closer. Draw us near. Here you are. 
after all. Show us today. I want that to be our prayer today that God you would show us your glory not just on Sunday morning but God that's our heart's cry all week long we just want to see your glory in everything I was reading this morning Psalm 16 5 8 and I love the way this says it. it says I am always aware of the Lord's presence he is near and nothing can shake me and I love that it says that nothing can shake me because as I was reading that I thought man that's what happens when God begins to show us his glory then when we recognize him when we recognize his presence that is so powerful in this room even right now then that means nothing can shake us in the world right now it looks really shaky right it looks scary if you just look in the world's terms but we know that when we're living within the presence of God when we're constantly seeking his glory seeking his face living in communion with the Lord, nothing can shake me. Nothing can shake me. God, we thank you for that this morning. God, we thank you for your word that remains true, remains alive. It's still the truth today that nothing can shake us when we're living in your presence. God, we need you. We need you, Father. The rest of this service, the rest of this day, the rest of this week, the rest of our lives, Father God, we need you. Walk with us. Walk beside us, Father. Guide us with your presence. We love you, Lord. You are so good and so worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give him some praise in this room. He is so good, so faithful to us. You can be seated. Check out the screen. Good morning and welcome to MCC. We are so glad that you're here. Whether you're right here in our physical location or you're joining us online, we are so honored and just excited to worship with you today. Hey, if you'd like to know anything else about MCC, anything going on around here, you can visit our website or you can email info at maranathadecav.org. Or you could even do my favorite option and opt in to get text updates right to your mobile device. It's great. You're not going to miss out on the thing. Make sure you do that. Hey, if you'd like to give your tithes and offerings this morning, you can go ahead and do that right now. Uh, you can give at the front or the back of the room. We have boxes at both of those locations. Or we have an iPad if you prefer to give online. Now, MCC Kids, you are going to have an incredible morning. I know there's so much fun stuff in store for you today. So you can go ahead. If you have kids ages birth through eighth grade, you can check them into their kids' classes now. You can do that. Go through the double doors to your left, and we'll have volunteers there ready to assist you. They're going to have an incredible morning. Everybody else, stand to your feet. Go ahead. Say hi to somebody next to you, and get ready for an exciting message.
everybody. How are you this morning? So good to see you this morning. Thank you for being here. Glad to see a little sunshine this morning, aren't you? All right. That always gets a little attention. If you're joining with us online today, we want to say a special welcome to you. Thank you so much. If you're here in person, we thank you for being here. We're excited about what God is doing and exciting about uh, uh, what, what's happening here at MCC. You know, we are having a, a, something we need special prayer about, and uh, we want to just join together with churches all over the country, pastors and leaders uh, all over the country. As you know, uh, the uh, uh, Ukraine is living right now under the threat of nuclear attack. And uh, it's looking more imminent that uh, Russia is probably going to unleash some nuclear weapons. And if you're a student of biblical prophecy, you see that there are a lot of things lining up. And we've been talking for a couple of years about these things lining up. And they're lining up even more and more right now uh, toward uh, that battle, that war you read over in Ezekiel chapter 38. And uh, just remember that uh, even so, God's in control. But we do want to pray because uh, we want to pray for the Ukraine people, pray for their protection. We know there's going to be a lot of things going on. We pray for Christians in Russia. You know, a lot of people in Russia are against this. They're not doing this. They're, they're, they're being led by a demonically inspired leader. And I don't say that lightly. He is demonically inspired, and uh, it could be that, that, uh, that he gets put in his spirit the desire to conquer more land and more land and more land. And it's going to happen one day, and he's going to turn his sights down south. And the Bible says that the enemy from the north is going to come south, and you go north of Jerusalem, you run right into Moscow. So it's going to happen someday. I'm not saying this is it, but uh, we need to be spiritually ready. We need to have our spiritual eyes open. We need to be continually praying and uh, because there are events that are going to happen uh, in the end times that we have no control over. But God has control over and he has control over us. So we need to pray, not live out of fear. We're going to talk more about that today as we continue our message on uh, the game plan of Satan. But I want us to just bow our heads right now and just pray and join Christians all over the world, really, uh, different time zones and different times. But our prayers are united. Father, we come on behalf of our world. On behalf of Christians everywhere, people everywhere, because your desire is that all people come to know Jesus Christ, to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. And we pray that as this evil is being poured out, revival will also be poured out, that it will spread across the Ukraine, across Europe, across the, the seas, across the world, even to the United States, that we might become a nation under God once again, that we might just fall on our faces and regardless of what anyone says or think become a nation that seeks you totally and completely. So we join together and we pray right now, your kingdom come, your will be done. In the name of Jesus, we claim Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And we just believe that and receive that. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We don't need to live in fear, but we need to live, like the Bible says, we need to be, have our eyes wide open and, and be alert, have spiritual ears and spiritual eyes. Well, in just a moment, I'm going to show you a little short video clip. You know, uh, we uh, have a, a sister church, a kind of a mission church that we helped start down in uh, Bucerias, Mexico, uh, Iglesia Cristo Te Ama, and uh, Pastor Carol Flores, and he stays in touch with us all the time, sends us pictures and videos, and and so we send help because the only money he gets, people there, are, they, they tithe, but their tithe is really, really low. And not, some won't even tithe, you know. They don't understand that tithing is God's plan for prosperity. It's like a lot of people in the United States don't believe that. They think the more you give, the less you have. But <laughs> in God's system of economy, the more you give, the more you get. And uh, so uh, they're, under, they're learning that, but they're doing a really great job down there. You know, when COVID hit, uh, they lost their building and they had, they couldn't meet. They were forbidden to meet publicly. So they moved up into the mountains and they'd just say, we're going to be at so-and-so place. They'd build a fire and have a little, little, uh, 
little arbor and stand up there and meet in the mountains. And now they've, things have opened back up, so they have a building that they're meeting in now, more of a permanent building. They were, they did. We, we were down there a couple of years ago, helped them build an arbor. And uh, so, uh, but now they have more of a permanent building. And they've got a really unique outreach, and I'm very excited about this. Uh, back a few months ago, they were needing an electric keyboard. And so we, uh, we said, hey, we'll buy that keyboard for you. He had it on layaway, so we sent money down and bought the keyboard. And then uh, here just the last week or so, they had an electric guitar that they were needing for their worship. And so we, they had it on layaway. We sent money down for an electric guitar. And what they do is they've got people in their congregation that know how to play those things, and they've got people out in the world who wish they knew how to play those. <laughs> now, think about that. They wish they could play. They said, we'll, we'll give you free lessons. Just come on up, and we'll give you free lessons. And why don't you stay for church? Why don't you come join? And so it's really working well. They're doing good. So I, I have a little clip of uh, Pastor Cairo. When they got the guitar, he took me a picture. They got it. And this is them. Go ahead and show the clip right now. He uh, had it there in front of some of his congregation, his kids, and they're opening it up. This is one of his sons. Father, we just thank you for the privilege of being a part of that work there. And uh, thank you for helping us to be a part of that work. It's exciting. We pray for Cairo and the church there and the things that they go through. And, it, you know, they send pictures all the time. Their, their baptisms are right out there in the Banderas Bay, right in the, and so it's so cool to see that. But all right, we're going to start again today uh, where we left off last week. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to read that same passage we read last week, so uh, kind of get as a foundation of what we were, what we were talking about. <clears throat> Notice in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it said, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. He wasn't wandering around out there aimlessly. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him out on a pinnacle of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone." Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a glance. You know, just at once he saw the whole kingdom. And he said, This is the glory of the world. And he said, If you'll just bow down to me, I will give all these things to you if you'll bow and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you. Remember that. And Jesus said, You know what? I'm tired of this stuff. Just get out of here and leave me alone. And Jesus said the things he did we're supposed to do. So do you ever just get sick and tired and say, devil, away with you. Get out of here. I'm sick and tired of you. It's kind of like when your cat runs in the house, you don't want to say, scat, cat, and give him a little kick on the way out the door. <laughs> because you have the sword of the Spirit. Just poke him as he goes. You know, uh, Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. We see so much insight from this little passage of Scripture how Satan himself dealt with Jesus. We have the king of evil trying to deal and take down the king of righteousness, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And so we understand that he was putting forth his best shot trying to trick Jesus, trying to get him all tripped up. So he was doing everything he could do. So we learn a lot about his game plan, about his strategy, and how he works. I'll tell you, remember last week I said, if you know your opponent's game plan, if you know the strategy they're going to use, it gives you a tremendous advantage. Well, Jesus opened up right here and said, this is Satan's game plan. 
And throughout the Bible, it says, don't be, don't be ignorant of, the, of his devices. This is one way we cannot be ignorant of his devices. We see how he had tempted Jesus and what he did to Jesus, and we know that he trained all his demonic evil ones that are under him, those myriads of de demons that are cast out upon, over in this world to steal, kill, and destroy. So we know they're going to operate on the same agenda that Satan does, they learn from him. So they're out there trying to do the same thing they did with Jesus. So once we know what they're doing, it should give us a little advantage. So remember this, from the very time Satan was cast out of heaven. By the way, Satan wasn't created evil. He was Lucifer. Lucifer was a bright and glorious, one of the archangels, only three archangels mentioned, three angels mentioned. It's Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. And Lucifer seemed to be in charge of praise and worship in heaven. No wonder he hates praise and worship because he knows the power of praise and worship. He knows when we lift our hearts and praise and we exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, we're, we're surrendering ourselves and we're yielding unto him. He hates it. He doesn't like praise. He, you can begin, let me tell you, when you feel evil coming against you, just begin to praise God. Praise and worship. That'll kick him out in a hurry. He'll leave in a hurry. Those, de those demons hate praise and worship. They'll run out screaming. But from the very beginning, with the lie in the Garden of Eden, Satan led Adam and Eve into the fall of mankind. The Bible says he's the father of lies. Every evil, despicable act in this world relates back to this event. The wars that we see going on right now, the murders, the stealing, abortion, drug addictions, all these things that are going on right now, they go back to that time when, when Satan himself came to Adam and Eve and he talked them into disobeying God. That's where this all entered. See, lying is Satan's primary strategy and weapon against mankind. So, last week we talked about some of the Tactics that he used, I'm going to brush up on real quickly so we can get to today's. One, he wants to, uh, to confuse us. Just get you confused about what's going on. Second, he wants to leave us hopeless. If you're, if you're feeling hopeless, and some of you do, I know we have some who feel hopeless at this time. If you're feeling hopeless, you know where that came from? If you're watching online and you have a hopeless feeling, you know where that comes from? It comes straight from the devil. Cast it out. Kick it out. Say, hopelessness, you're not going to stay here. That's the spirit of, of, of evil. There are evil spirits that their sole goal is to bring hopelessness to you. So don't put up with it. Don't sit there and toy around with it and say, well, I just feel so hopeless. I, I just, I, I wish somebody would pity me because it just, every, I'm, I'm in a hopeless, you know, look, everybody's in a hopeless situation without Jesus Christ. But you don't have to be without Jesus Christ because he said, I'm here with you. I'll be yours. I want to be your Savior. I died for your sin. So nobody has to be without Christ. So we don't have to be without hope because Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. And thirdly, he wants to discredit or to twist God's word. Notice what he did. We're going to talk about this a little more uh, as we go along. Notice what he did when he was talking to Jesus. He twisted the word of God. You know, Satan knows the Bible. He knows the Bible better than most of us do. And he knows that it's true, every word of it's true, but if he can get you to believe a lie and not believe it's true, then it's t to you it might as well not be true. Do you understand what I'm talking about? It's true if we appropriate it, but if we don't appropriate it, it doesn't work for us. It's, we got to use it. And so he tries to get us to just dismiss the word of God and start depending on the government, start depending on science, start depending on medicine, start depending on other things. He knows the word of God is true and he'll twist it. Many people who have trusted Christ as their Savior have suffered repeated defeat after repeated defeat after repeated defeat because they were not taught this truth. They don't understand that it's not the system, it's not your neighbor, it's not your spouse, it's not your in-laws, it's not your boss. The enemy, the devil comes in, the Bible says, for to steal, to kill, and destroy. Satan has a game plan, he has a strategy, and it is to defeat you. He's got minions assigned to you yourself. You've got some. They follow you wherever you go. They try to steal, kill, and destroy you any way they can. So give them trouble. <laughs> give them trouble. Don't just let them come along and kick you in the rear and you just say, oh, I wish they'd stop doing that. Turn around and the Bible says, humble yourself before God. God, I think you've given me authority in the name of Jesus Christ. You turn around and do what Jesus said. Now you get out of here and leave me alone right now. Leave me alone. I'm not putting up with you, you little demon imp. You get out of here in the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, the name at which every knee will bow. See, many Christians don't realize that you have a spiritual enemy. You say, well, because your spiritual is not real. No, the spiritual realm is the real realm. The natural realm is the 
is the realm that's not real. Oh, we're living in, but it's, it's passing away. The spiritual realm supersedes the, the natural realm, and it rules the natural realm. So when we try to rule the spiritual realm through the natural, we don't get anywhere. You've got to rule the natural from the spiritual standpoint. That's why the Bible says that Christ was raised up, seated with, in the right hand of the Father, and you were also raised up together with him so that we don't have to be locked into this natural realm. We can operate from the spiritual realm into the natural realm. You say, that sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Get alone and pray over that. Get alone and pray over that and just ask the Holy Spirit to give you the insight to know that you are operating from the realm of the Spirit. You are a nation of kings and priests. We have, we have entrance and we have the name and the authority of Jesus. And he said, take my name and destroy the kingdom of darkness. And that's what he's told us to do. He told his disciples to do that and said, now you teach others to do the same thing. See, so often... We weren't told this. Let me ask you, when, when you were growing up, did you have much teaching on spiritual warfare? Or did you just think, well, you know, the devil's bad and God's good, so the devil with the devil and good with God. But, you know, the devil's down there in Africa somewhere because he doesn't come up here because we're too educated. And, you know, we're so educated that we're ignorant. <laughs> if, we think we're, if we think we're too educated to believe in spiritual warfare then we're, we're, he's doing a good job against us because we're ignorant of his devices. And the Bible clearly says, do not be ignorant of the devil's devices. So he's working against you. He would like to work against you right now. He, he doesn't sleep either. That's why every night when we pray, we pray a hedge of protection around our home. We pray over our minds as we sleep because we're going to talk in a few minutes that the battleground is in your mind. If the devil can get you to thinking something, he'll get you to speak something. You get to speak something, then you get what? Because you see, you have what you say. Don't ignore the facts, but don't give in to them either. Speak truth to the fact, because truth supersedes fact. See, truth is the man was blind. The fact was Jesus was coming, and Jesus supersedes blindness. So we can understand that truth supersedes fact. I was not told growing up about this spiritual warfare. And we don't do this and we don't teach this to scare anybody, but in our children's ministry, we teach them that there's an enemy that comes against you to steal, kill, and destroy. Why? Not to scare them, to prepare them. Remember what we said last week? If you're prepared, you don't have to be scared. Some people say, well, I just don't want to know anything about the devil. I just want to leave him alone let him leave me alone. One side of that's true. You can leave him alone, but he's not going to leave you alone. The more you leave him alone, the more he's going to come against you. Because he says, they're easy picking. I got them anytime I want to, but they don't even really believe in me. They don't ever exercise authority. Now, those who understand the word of God, and they take on the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and, all the, and the sword of the spirit, and they say, all right, devil, I'm ready. Come on. They say, man, I wish I didn't have to face him today. I don't want to face her. She knows her weapon, and she'll get me with the word every time. I come at her, and she uses that big shield, and it splatters me against it, and then she takes that sword of the spirit and jabs me. Make those demons hate to come after you. Teach them a lesson. Reveal to them the authority in Christ Jesus that you have also and that you know you have that. They understand that you have, but they don't know that you know. They want to make sure you know. So we're here to prepare people, not to scare people. And today we're going to continue in that preparation and uh, in learning. Because let me tell you, Satan is always working to mislead and blind people to the truth regarding Christ and his salvation. Oh, he'll tell you, yeah, you're saved, you're going to go to heaven, but not, you can't do anything about what's going on right now. You know, if you can't keep him getting saved, he'll at least say, well, yeah, you're mine until you leave here. You don't have any authority, but the Bible says that we do have authority. He is and has been a liar from the beginning. We talked about that last week. See, when Jesus spoke to the religious leaders, here's what he said. They wouldn't believe the truth, and I've read this scripture to you. I love this scripture because it reveals, it cuts right through the heart of of pseudo-religion, cuts right through the heart of false teachings, and it says this, you belong to your father, the devil. He told them. They were the religious leaders. Don't you know they love that? I bet they didn't say amen to that. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. In other words, you're doing the devil's work. Not very popular to go into a, to a religious meeting and say, you're of your father, the devil, and you're carrying out the devil's work here. He said, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. This is the NIV Bible. For he is a liar and the father of lies. That was Jesus speaking. 
Now, in another passage of Scripture, in John, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You want to know the way? I'm the way. You want to know the truth? Look at me. You want to know life? Find it in me. So Jesus made a contrast in his teaching. He said, he's the devil. You're following him. He's a liar. I'm truth. Follow me. I'm the way. Follow me. I'm life. Follow me. Anyone or anything that contradicts what Jesus said is a liar. So if someone tells you the devil's not real, they're a liar. And they're speaking the lies of the one that they're serving because he's got them deceived. So don't believe if someone says, well, no, there's not a real devil, you know. Yeah, there's evil in the world, but no, there is a real devil. We know who he is. We know where he came from. He got kicked out of heaven. He was Lucifer. Now he's Satan, and he's kicked out of heaven, and he's hell-bent on destroying every human being he can, destroying God's plan for this earth. He knows his doom is coming, and he wants to take you with him. He wants to take as many as he can with him. Today we're going to pick up where we left off. Satan's battleground is the mind. The battleground's in the mind. It's been said, he who controls the mind controls the individual. He infiltrates us with lies, and get this, even believers are not immune to them. You are not immune to the lies of the devil. I'm sure that you've believed some in the past, maybe believing some right now. We talk to people all the time that are believing a lie. I talked to someone one time, said, I've sinned too much. I cannot be forgiven. I was told I cannot be forgiven. I said, who told you that? I said, the Spirit. I said, it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. Well, you don't know what all I've done in my past. I don't care. Key word there, past. And Jesus' blood cancels your past. But see, the devil will lie. Oh, he'll tell you something like this. Oh, yeah, everybody else can, but you can't. Have you ever heard something like that? You ever believe the lie and the devil said, well, I know, yeah, I know they're going to be saved. I know they're going to have a good life, but it's my lot. It's just the cards that I drew. No, you know, fold those up and draw some more because you're, you're looking at the devil's cards. If you don't have hope and peace and joy in your life, you're looking at the wrong stack. The devil's a liar, and he lies to believers, and many believers believe him. They believe him and not believe the word. Most often, our issues and bondages can be traced back to a time that we believed a lie from Satan. We've talked to people who said, said well, you know, back when I was a kid, I was told that I'll never amount to anything. That's a lie. God never said to anybody, you'll never amount to anything. He says, I placed within you seed, and if you'll let me, I'll develop that seed. Many people who overcame that lie have gone on to be great Christian leaders, great inventors, great men of God, great men of, the, of society, because they didn't believe the lie. Maybe you were mistreated as a child, and the devil said, because of that, you'll never be able to amount to anything. That God, will, you'll never have a real relationship with God. That's the devil's lie. He's been doing it from the beginning. Why do you think he would change now? He lies and he tells us things that aren't true. And when we believe those things, it might as well be true. Because we're going to act as though it were true. The sad thing is when people believe a lie and act as though the lie were true, because if they do, then the result is the lie is true for them. Because they believed the lie and they didn't stand against it. Does that make sense? Because you see, if you're going to have what you believe. And if you believe that you'll never amount to anything, if you believe God doesn't love you, then you're going to feel that way all your life, and you're going to feel resistance toward God. If you believe that what you did was so evil that God can't forgive you or that God could forgive you but doesn't want to, let me tell you, if God doesn't forgive a sin you committed, he's spitting on Jesus. Because the Bible says Jesus died for our sin, all sin. They'll tell you, nobody really ever cares about you. We talk to people, and they'll say, you know, nobody really cares for me. You know, I know some people have more friends than others. Some people don't have friends because they're not being a friend. But, you know, that, they'll say, well, if devil can get you to believe that nobody cares about you so you don't care about anybody else, he's got you isolated. And when he gets you isolated, he's got you defeated. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. God will forgive others, but he won't forgive me. I've gone too far. Oh, you're not nice enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're not talented enough. You're not educated enough. You didn't come to the right side of the track. So therefore, don't expect to get anything good out of this life. 
You might have been born on the wrong side of the track, but you were re reborn on the right side. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> See, if we believe he's lie, his lies and not God's word, we're going to suffer loss. The devil's trick is try to accuse us and make us feel like God doesn't love us and even tell us we're not even saved. Have you ever heard that? Well, you must not be saved if you thought that thought. You, I thought a saved person wouldn't think like that. A saved person wouldn't have done that. You, you, you're so caught up in bitterness and anger and so forth, you must not be really saved. Salvation is not by works. It's by grace through faith. Our salvation comes because we put our faith and trust in Jesus, not because we get our act cleaned up. Jesus wants to clean our act up, and he wants to help us clean it up, but salvation is not based on Jesus plus act cleaning up. It's based on Jesus Christ and him alone. Put your faith and trust in Christ and tell the devil to take it and leave with it. See, the devil may tell us those things, but the Holy Spirit, on the other hand, says this. You're God's child. See, that one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit, ministry of the Spirit, is to, to lead us into righteousness, to convince us that we're righteous, to convict us when we're wrong. Yeah, if we do something wrong, he convicts us, but he doesn't condemn us. The devil condemns, the Holy Spirit convicts. The difference in condemnation and conviction is condemnation pushes you away from God. He'll never forgive me for this. I can't go to God anymore because I'm under, I've, I've done this. Conviction says I was wrong, I know, but the Holy Spirit is drawing me to God to be forgiven so that I can be right with God again. God wants every one of his children to be right with him all the time. So if you're not right with God today, guess whose fault it is? Not God's because he's ready. He's got his arms open wide and says, come, repent, I forgive you. It's all through the scripture. Paul said it. Uh, John said it. It's all through scripture. Talk about repenting and coming back. The story of the prodigal is a perfect example. He came back and the father ran to meet him and to greet him. Christ's death on the cross means we can never be separated from our Savior. We're not going to be lost again. We're going to be his forever. But see, Satan's strategies are carefully planned you know, he's had a long time to map out his strategies. He knows what works, what doesn't work. Because mankind's basically the same. So he's been practicing for generation and generation and generation. He's got it honed down pretty good. And he knows exactly where to hit you. He knows exactly where to hit me. He knows what to bring up to you to cause you to, to fear, to fall, to quit. He knows exactly how to ruin your day. So he knows the human makeup so well he can't read your mind, but he can read your body language. He knows when you're sweating. He knows when he's about to get to. He knows when you're having a hard day. Usually we tell him. He doesn't have to, to read our body language. We usually say, man, I think I'm just going to die if things don't get better. He's a hot dog. I got them. They're ready. They're prime. Go get them. Go get them. But when you start speaking faith-filled words, they say, man, I don't really want to go there. You know, that's, I, I, don't, I don't really want to. I go to that place today. They're too, I know they're under pressure, but still, under pressure, they're still speaking God's word. They're still speaking in agreement. They're still praising and worshiping God. I don't know if I want to go to them or not. So Satan has seven basic ways that he attacks. One, he directs our attention toward a need or desire. He directs our attention toward something we need or something we desire, and he makes that become the most important thing in our lives. This strategy began in the perfect environment. In the Garden of Eden, when Satan drew Eve's attention away from God's abundance and provision to the one thing that God said, don't touch. Everything else was there, but he said, leave that tree alone. And he didn't explain. He just said, it's not good for you. Leave it alone. But see, they wouldn't believe God, but they believed a the lie. Here he comes with that lie. He believed, they believed the lie. He turned their attention away from all the other fruit in the garden. He said, that is the best fruit. You, God, you really need to get that God's holding out on you. Have you ever felt like God's holding out on you? Guess who's telling you that? Well, everybody else is God. I don't have this. I don't have that. You better watch out when you start talking like that because when you start talking like that, you're a bait. You become demon bait, and they come at you, and they say, that's right, that's right. Oh, yeah, everybody else got it, but God doesn't really love you, God. You ought to just go, you ought to just go do it. You ought to just turn your back on God. Don't worry about what God said. Just go do what you want to do. He's been using that same technique ever since to stir up lust for a particular person, greed for a possession, or envy for what belongs to another person. 
His lie consists of saying that having these objects of your desire will satisfy you. Let me ask you a serious question. And, and, and this is a genuine question. It's not a trick question. Have you ever desired something so bad, so much, that you thought about it all the time, you talked about it all the time, you, you dreamed about it, you want it, you want it, you want it, and it wasn't anything bad. It's just something you really wanted. And I'm not saying God didn't want you to have it, but then you got it, and all of a sudden you thought, Hmm, that didn't bring as much satisfaction as I thought it would. Have you ever done something like that? Thought, man, I, this is what I want. This is what I need. And you get it and you think, eh, there's something else over there, though, I really would like to have. See, when, when, when things are our desires, things never satisfy. The Bible says like this, he who seeks silver is never satisfied with silver. Because when you get it, you think, there ought to be more to it than this. You, you, really, you really wanted that promotion, and you worked, and you worked, and you worked, and you did everything you could do uh, short of cheating and lying and stealing. Maybe did a little bit of that. No. <laughs> you did everything you could do, and you got that promotion. You got there, and you thought, yeah, this ain't really what I thought it was going to be. I thought it would bring me some notoriety. People would respect me. I thought I was going to climb up that social ladder, that uh, corporate ladder, and everything's going to be good. Tell you the truth, it's harder now than it was then. I wish I was back where I was. That's what the devil does. He, he dangles things out there. It says in James that he, uh, he lures us away with the lust of the flesh. It's like, it's, it's a fishing term. We've got some fishermen in here. You know what you do. You cast that lure out there and you get it right beside that, you pull it right beside that stump or that log and you kind of jiggle it a little bit. And man, that bass just can't stand it. He can stand at it, but when he jiggles, he got to get it. And that's what the devil does. He brings it out there to you, and you see it, and you say, yeah, I don't, I don't care about that. And he stops right in front of him. You just jiggles it a little bit. And your desires spawn, and you think, i got to have it. And so you go for it, and you're hooked. If bass could think, if bass could talk, they would say, stay away from the jiggle. <laughs> when it jiggles, Run. And that's what God said to us. Stay away from it. The Bible says, submit yourself to God and resist the devil. Stay away from it. Run from evil. Eschew evil. Run from it. Get away from it. He's been using that same tactic forever and forever. He says, if you'll just get this, it'll be better for you. Let me, can I tell you something? Nothing outside of God's will for you is good. So just simply pray, God, all I want is what you want for me. And you'll find that is a key to success. I just want what you want. So the second thing the devil does, he chooses times when we are at our strongest. No, he waits till we're at our weakest. He causes a few circumstances, situations. Maybe we've been up all night with the kids and maybe, you know, we've been battling sickness. And we just think we're just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And he comes when you're weakest and he jumps on you. And you say, every, every, God, every bit of spiritual strength I have, I have to muster it up to try to get through this. Don't depend on your own strength. The Bible says he's our strength, a very present help in trouble, like we read this morning. God is my refuge. God is my strength. The devil tries to trip us up when we're at our weakest point. Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. I've never fasted a, a total fast for 40 days. That would be hard. He came to Jesus when he was weak, and he said, make this turn into bread. Wouldn't a nice warm loaf of bread? I'll bring the butter and the honey. He fixed us at a weak time, at a time when we're at our wit's end, a time where we're at the end of the rope. We're just hanging on for all, by a thread. And he, hang, he said, just let go. Just do this. Just cast up. Forget it. Don't go to church anymore. It's not working. Don't give to that cause. Don't go visit sick people. Don't do anything. Just let it go. I'm tired, not going well, edgy, been to fight all day long with the kids. He knows exactly what to say and what to use to lure you away. When the Bible says God is not a respecter of persons, the devil's not a respecter of persons, he does not respect you. When God, then the Bible says God's not respected for He means he loves everybody. When devil does not respect you, it means he hates everybody. And he hates you with an, with a, a, you don't, you've never seen pure hatred probably. 
See, the devil, you say, well, the devil, you know, the devil, he'll take it easy on little kids because they're so cute and sweet. No, he can't. He has no ability to have compassion. God is love. The devil has none of it. God has, no, God has compassion. The devil has no compassion. He doesn't care. That you're, look, your grandkids, he hates them. You love them and love them, love them. Your, your family, you love He hates you with a pure, perfect hatred. And you look what he's doing around the world. You say, how could anybody do something that terrible? How could they beat that little six-month-old baby till it died and then go throw it in a creek? How could they do that? Because the devil is full of hatred, and he hates everybody. He hates you with a perfect hatred. Now, I can get mad at somebody, but I get over it usually. The devil never gets over it. He hates you with every bit of hatred that there is to have, pure hatred. Just as pure as God's love is, so his hate is that pure. Not a bit of compassion in it. He chooses you when you're weak, and he knows exactly what to say and do to lure you away. After Jesus fasted those 40 days, what did he say? Satan came testing him to do what? Well, do, there's nothing wrong with eating food, is there? Nothing wrong with turning. I mean, everybody, it's okay to eat, right? That's the devil's strategy. See, Jesus didn't turn to serve himself that day. He obeyed the Father. In the same way, here's a little example. When the devil comes to you, when you're worn out, when you're, when you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're tired, you know what you need to do? H A L T. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, halt. Stop right there. Don't go any further. See? Don't, don't take it and run with it. Don't listen to his, oh, he'll sympathize with you. Poor old you aren't. No, everybody's treating you bad. Don't you think you ought to go and halt? When you, when you feel those things coming, do exactly halt and stop right there when we're tempted in a point of our vulnerability. We must stop and consider, you know what? I know where this is coming from. Yes, I'm worn out. Yes, I'm tired. Yes, I'm, I'm edgy. Yes, I'm this. But I need to stop right now and turn to where my strength is. Recognize it for what it is. Third thing, he wants to create doubt in your minds. Have you ever doubted God's word? Please don't be super spiritual. Sorry. I never doubted God's word. <laughs> We've all doubted, haven't we? We've all said, God, I don't understand this. Why? That's the, when we ask God why, that's doubting. Like, God, I don't understand why you didn't do this, so I'm, I'm wondering, are you really as good as you say you are? Do you really love the way you love? You, can you really do what you say you can do? He creates doubt in our minds because he wants us to doubt the truth of God's word. He wants to doubt the love that God has for us. He wants to doubt us to doubt God's ability to deliver us. And he wants us to doubt that God loves and cares for us. You ever heard this? God doesn't really love you. Oh, yeah, he loves them. But you know what? He doesn't really love you. Oh, he, you're okay to him, but he really loves some people. You just He just kind of puts up with. <laughs> Look, you're not just to put up with, okay? God really does love you. See, here's how he, here's how he cre creates doubt. Look at, look at his strategy. We see it when Jesus was talking to him. And he said, if you are the son of God, is there some doubt in that statement? Satan is doubting. I don't know if you really are. But if you are, and he, and so he, he'll come to you and say, if you're really a spirit-filled Christian, you wouldn't be having these thoughts. If you're really saved, you wouldn't be thinking this way. If you're really a child of God, no child of God ever. Are you really a child of God? Do you really believe that there's a literal hell? Do you really believe that somebody dying on a cross 2,000 years ago could really affect your life today? He'll bring doubt in your mind. He's, a, he's an expert at bringing doubt. He said to Eve, did God really say? And she thought, hmm. I thought he did. But did he really say that? I don't know. Well, why do you think he would say that? I don't know why. Well, maybe he said that because he doesn't want you to have his best. Oh, did God really say to you? Did he really say that? Well, why would he say that to you? Do you think God's holding out on you? And so he'll just twist things around, create doubt, and you'll begin to say, you know, that's true. I see other people drive new cars. How can I have one right now? Why don't I have a nicer house? Why didn't I get that raise? Does God really care about me? And he'll just put those thoughts in your mind. Next thing you know, he'll be accusing God to you, and you'll be thinking, you know what? That's right. 
You'll find up agreeing, end up agreeing with him. He'll tell you, if you're really a Christian and God really loved you, yes, Satan loves to target the word of God. He'll put doubt on it and make you think, I don't know if that's true or not. He wants believers to rationalize themselves into disobedience by misinterpreting verses or taking them out of context. Satan was quoting the Bible to Jesus, wasn't he? But Jesus said, you got it wrong. You're taken out of context. You're, you, don't let him quote the Bible to you out of context. Many people do that. Take the Bible and take it out of context to rationalize or to justify what they want. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you something I, I used to hear. It was a long time ago now. I used to hear a long time ago. Some of my hippie friends. <laughs> some of the flower generation. Well, you know, the Bible says, uh, God said, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit is seed, so it shall be for you food. So you know what? It's okay to smoke the stuff. Well, yeah, the Bible says it, but who twisted that scripture around? <laughs> See, that's, that's just an example of how the devil does it. Once the devil gets people to doubt, to doubt the veracity of any part of the Bible or declare those parts irrelevant or outdated, yeah, that was for them. That's not for us. I hear people say that all the time about tithing. Well, that was Old Testament. Well, Jesus said to do it, didn't he? He said, when you bring your tithes of the mints and these, all these things, which you ought to do, he said you ought to do these things. He didn't say stop doing them, but people said, well, that was all Old Testament. The New Testament doesn't teach tithing. Look, if Jesus didn't cancel it, it's still going. So anyway, people like to use that to, to not get in on, on the blessings of God. He wants us to to believe his lies by casting doubt on his word. The fourth thing, he wants you to get in a debate with him. Don't debate the devil. Jesus didn't debate, did he? Did Jesus debate with him? Jesus shut him off. He said, it's written. If you'll just say it is written, you'll stop the arguments. But yeah, but I mean, you know, it looks like it might, in this instance, it looks like that would be okay. I think it might be okay. I think God would probably let, excuse this. I know the Bible says something. How many times have we had people say, I know the Bible says it, but I say, stop right there. Get your butt out of there. Don't say the Bible says this, but you know what you're doing? Debating with the devil when you do that. You're saying that God said this, but I think so and so. It's exactly what. Satan told Adam and Eve in the garden, I know God said this, but he had an ulterior motive. He was trying to trick you. He didn't want you to know how good that fruit was. He's holding out on you. Never debate the devil. Just simply say, it is written. And quote the scripture. Jesus said, it is written. You shall have no other gods before me. I will never bow down and worship you. God's commands are not given to keep us from something good. They're given to protect us from something evil and harmful. Self-destruction of sin. Number five, he uses deception as a key weapon. He wants to deceive. Notice what Satan said to Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, eat this and you will be like God. You know what? He told them the truth. He told them the truth. But he said it in such a way to deceive because he knew God said, don't eat it. Why does it mean? Eat this. It sounds good, doesn't it? Eat this and you'll be like God. But man was never created to bake up his own mind what was good and what was evil. God said everything he created is good. It's all good. It's all good. Take all this stuff. It's good. Don't worry about that tree because that will show you what's evil. You don't want to know what's evil. You just want the good. And the devil said, hey, God's holding out on you. Go eat from that tree and you'll be like God. And you know what they did? Man became his own God, deciding for himself what's good and what's evil. So now we've got all these laws trumping on everybody's rights and trumping everybody else. This law trumps on your right, and this law trumps on their right, and everybody's deciding for themselves what's good and what's evil. That's straight from the tree, straight from the lie. Do not argue with the devil. Do not let him use deception to keep you in bondage or to get you in bondage. Satan used man to insert evil through his disobedience. It should have never gotten out of the tree. It should have stayed right there. But you see, you know, you know how long it took for there to be a murder? The first generation, Cain killed Abel. Evil came into the world. 
So Cain said, I know what's good and I know what's evil and you're evil, I'm going to kill you. And so we've been doing it ever since. Number six, he wants to create division. The Bible talks about how precious and how wonderful is the spirit of unity. It's like an oil that flows down the, the head and down Aaron's beard and goes through the whole body. Unity in the body, the devil hates it. That's why he's trying to get you and you to fuss with each other. That's why he's trying to cause the, the east side to split with the west side, the north side to split with the south side. He'd love to have this church divided up into four or five different factions. One of the greatest hindrances to most churches that we've been a part of is the factions in the church fighting against each other. We don't have faction practice here. We believe we're one body, one head, one spirit, one God, and we're going to follow him. It's not about personal preference. It's not about uh, what I think it ought to be or what you think it ought to be. It's God, what do you think? The only question to ask in making decisions is, God, what do you want? Not what's most popular. Not what does everybody else. If you notice in the Bible when the people voted, they missed God because they wanted what they wanted. Moses sought God and said, this is what God wants. This is what we're going to do. Be careful. God, he wants unity. And it talks about all through Corinthians about the unity of the body and uh, one body and one flesh and so forth. He wants to convince young people that the Bible is outdated and the older people in the church, they just don't know what's going on. Let me tell you, when I came from a young person to an old person, he's still doing it. He used to tell me that that was outdated. And that then when I got over there, and I became one of them. I saw, I realized, you know what? It wasn't outdated then. It's not outdated now. It's the same. Because his word's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not going to change it. Jesus is the word of God. It stays forever. And there's not going to be any change. His goal is to re replace unity in the body, in the family. Oh, he would love to have you and your, he loved to split families up. How many of you have brothers and sisters you had not spoken to in years and years? Because you have a problem. He wants to do that. That's what he loves. He divides them and he laughs at them. He wants to keep you from enjoying the fellowship of your family. Parents who haven't spoken to their kids in years because something happened a long time ago, and there's a good chance that when that happened, the devil put a lie in the midst of it, and people believed things that weren't true, and they separated. But they won't talk to each other now about it because he's the master of deceiving and dividing. He wants to create division. God's word promotes harmony and peace and godliness and healthy relationships, but Satan comes in to stir up doubts about its validity and its truth. Now, a body divided is a weak body. That's why we're a strong body, because we're not a body divided. We have one calling, one common cause, one purpose. A weak body is also easily defeated. If your family's divided, you're going to see your family a lot of us walking in, in, in defeat, because division creates defeat. The seventh goal, say the seventh goal. That's his last one. Okay, here we go. His overall goal is our destruction. That doesn't surprise anybody, does it? We know that. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the Bible tells us. So his overall goal is destruction. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy everyone in here. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your dreams. He wants to destroy your vision. He wants to destroy your usefulness. He wants to destroy your finances. He steals, kills, and destroys. If he can convince people to doubt a portion of the scripture, he can persuade them to reject even more of it, and he wants to destroy. Hence, the battle over creation. He wants to destroy the validity of the word of God. There was not a virgin born. That's impossible. That stuff in the Old Testament couldn't be true. It's just fairy tales. That flood didn't really happen. All that stuff about the devil, it's not really real. He likes to, do, he likes to make you think he's not even real. He wants to bring destruction, and the more deception he can bring, the more destruction he can bring. You see, Satan's a liar who stands against the truth. The truth is God's word. Those who belong to Christ believe his word. His word's our greatest protection against his lies. Jesus said this, sanctify them through the truth. Your word is truth. Set apart. Sanctify means to set, set them apart by the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We fill our minds with Scripture so we can quote Scripture back when the devil quotes us something else. 
Satan's schemes lose their power over us. Don't let your mind become filled with fear, doubt, worry, and unbelief. He's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he wants to do. He does nothing good. So what do I do with what I know? What do I do? We know Satan's plan. We know his methods. We know he's already a loser. We know he's already defeated. So what do we do? Don't pay attention to him. Stay away from him. When he says something, call him what he is, a liar, and turn from it. We know we win. We know we win. Have you read the last chapter? We win. You say, what if, I, what if the Russia comes over and we all die? We win. <laughs> what if Jesus comes back today? We won. <laughs> We're there. All right. Yeah, we, in this world, you're going to have these issues. But we're sitting in here to straighten issues out, not to get confused by the issues. Jesus left us here and said, now you go out and you straighten this mess out. Somebody said the Christian turned the world upside down. No, they didn't. They turned the world back right side up. The devil turned it upside down. We turned it right side up. We win. So what about you today? Where are you today? I'm going to kind of close with some of the same things I asked about last week because we talked about some different things today, didn't we? Some of the same things. Where are you today? What kind of battles are going on in your mind today? As we were talking those things, what struck in your mind? Whoa, that's, the, that's, what I, that's going on with me right now. Hey, I, I didn't realize I was doing that. All of a sudden, I realized I, I do that. I feel that way. I've been there. I'm still there. What's going on with you right now? You have fear, anger, resentment, bitterness, going through temptations, unholy thoughts, battles that you're tired of fighting, I'm just so tired of fighting these battles. Sure. Have you been listening to God not considering what he says or have you been listening to the devil considering what he says? Are you quoting scripture or are you quoting philosophy? Philosophy doesn't work. Scripture does. Satan's the father of lies. He is. Then are there areas in your life that you've believed a lie? When we were talking about some of those things, did you say, you know what? I've been believing that all my life. I don't know. I just thought because I had red hair, I had to be angry all the time. I had a bad temper. <laughs> You know, people say, oh, boy, you're a redhead. You've got a bad temper. I didn't see that in the Bible. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people, they just they blame their temper on, well, that's just my family. You know, we just, we, just, we just have a bad temper. Our family is just that way. You know what? You did have your old family history and your old family genetics, but if you've been saved, you've been born again, now you've got the genetics of the Father. <laughs> you don't have to be constrained by what you used to be. Become who you are. Hey, I don't have to be that way anymore. I don't have to have this temper anymore. I've been born again. Holy Spirit, give me strength. Jesus, teach me how to walk in victory and not walk in this with a chip on my shoulder all the time. How do I stay out of this anger, this worry, this unbelief? How do I stay away this stuff? Do you know scriptures to use to refute those lies? Find some scriptures so when the devil brings a lie to you, you can quote the scripture to him. Take that sword and jab him with it. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. Do you know God's word is true? From Genesis to Revelation, it's true. God never spoke a lie. It's true. Build your life on his word. Stand on his word. To the degree that we believe that truth, that the word of God is true, we will, we'll, we'll, we'll live. To the degree that we think, well, I'm not sure, then we'll let it slide. You've got to know for sure that the word of God is true. Settle it in your heart. Live according to God's revealed truth. Are you doing that? Or have you turned the coin over and are you living uh, according to some of the lies that the devil's told you? Have you bought into a lie? I hope not. But if you have, guess what? You can, you can renounce it right now. You can renounce it right now. All you got to do is say, you know what? I see that was a lie. I renounce that lie, and I stand on the truth of God. It's so simple. Just, I, 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 I take that lie that I granted you permission by believing a lie. I cancel that permission right now. I cancel that invitation for you to come to my life and bother me. I cancel it. I speak the word of God. You're a liar, and I get behind me, Satan. Leave me alone. I don't have to put up with you. Many justify denying God's truth because so many other people do. My mother used to tell me, if everybody else jumped in the off the bridge and died, are you going to jump off the bridge? And to be honored, I said, yeah, probably. But I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't. I'm not going to commit spiritual or even physical suicide because other people do it. 
I'm not going to sell out to the devil because other people are selling out to the devil. You know, here's what I learned. Sell out to Jesus Christ. If you sell out to somebody, you won't be bought out by somebody else. So if you sell out to Jesus, the devil comes to you and says, I'll give you this, I'll give you this. They say, oh, too late, I've already sold out to Jesus. I'm not going to believe your lies. I've already sold out to the word of God that it's true. And I, if, it, if you contradict the word, I'm going to call you who you are, you liar, and I get away from me. I know we like to scream in Jesus' name, but, but the fact that we are children of God, we have Jesus all in. When we speak it, it's as though Jesus was speaking it. Sometimes it helps us to say in Jesus' name, and we, you know, but the devil already knows whose authority you're speaking in. When you speak, he knows. He knows. How can I defend myself against Satan's game plan? The Bible says, here's how we do it. Be sober, be vigilant. It means be aware. Be on watch. Be looking. Be aware of what's going on. Understand the times. Your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, seeking who may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Don't just resist him steadfast because you don't have anything to resist with. Resist him steadfast in the faith that you're a child of God, that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the word of God is true, knowing the same suffering or experience by your brothers all through the world. Pray often. Pray. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. Study God's word. Meditate on God's word. Affirm your faith. Stay connected to a local body. Separate from the body. You isolate yourself and you open yourself up to greater attack. There's strength in numbers. We are better together. It says in Corinthians, the body of Christ is united together, and we get stronger because we're put together like a brick wall. A brick wall is stronger than a brick laying by itself. We're stronger together. This is not an ugly word, accountability. Many people say, well, I don't want to become a member of the church, but I, won't, I don't want anybody checking on me if I don't come. I don't want any accountability, in other words. The Bible says be accountable. We are accountable to the Holy Spirit. We need to be accountable to one another. It says bear one another's burdens. Be accountable to each other. If you don't show up for six weeks, we're going to find out why. Oh, well, uh, I, we know we bought this camper and we got to use it, you know. Okay. Well, go ahead and use your camper. We're checking on you, though. Well, see, that's why I didn't want to join the church. I didn't want to buy checking on me. Accountability, there's nothing wrong with accountability. We all need to be held accountable. My wife holds me accountable. I hold her accountable. We hold our kids accountable. They hold us accountable. You hold me accountable, I hold you accountable. If you see me down there at the bar somewhere, you come call me out on it, okay? I'll try to find another. No, just kidding. <laughs> this past Sunday, I kind of, I, I know it's time to quit, but I, I just have to tell you, I kind of freaked somebody out because we pulled into church here and there was a big rum bottle. I thought it was a whiskey bottle laying out there by the sidewalk. And I told him, she, I said, oh, man, somebody threw it. It didn't have any in it. That's how I get most of my whiskey. <laughs> but, see, I, you don't understand that. I drink all the whiskey I want to. I don't want to. But what really freaked out was somebody went and picked that bottle up, told me they picked it up and threw it in the trash. I said, oh, man, do you have anything left in it? I used to get my whiskey that way. And they started laughing. And I think they knew I was kidding. I know they knew I was kidding. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to shock people, you know, into reality. We're all human, aren't we? I mean, no, I, don't, I wouldn't drink it if it was there. I don't like it. I don't want it. But, it, you know, we hold each other accountable, right? I want you to bow your heads with me. This morning, we've heard a lot. The last two weeks, we've heard an amazing lot. There's a whole seminary course in what we learned today in the last two weeks. We could take in six weeks. Um, uh, we could take in a, a semester to learn these things. So we've kind of gone through this pretty quickly. If you're watching online, we've given a lot of information. But see, Holy Spirit's able to take that information, put it into your mind, and keep it there and bring it up when you need it. Whenever you need it, he brings it up to you. So just ask him, Holy Spirit, settle this stuff in my mind. And when the enemy comes in, remind me of what I need to know at that time to stand against him, to be victorious over him, to do what I need to do. This morning, in just a few moments, we're going to stand. And if you need to be prayed over, we're going to pray over you.
you want to just stand right there, I'm going to pray over a whole congregation again like I did last week. But if you have something specific that you're praying about, you want someone to agree with you, Michelle and I will be here at the front to agree with you. If you've never put your faith and trust in Christ and you're wondering right now, if I died, if this thing, war broke out and the end of the world came, would I really go to heaven or would I miss my opportunity? No one in here should ever miss heaven because you get an opportunity today to sign up, to invite Christ into your life, to be your Savior, to be your Lord, to be your boss, to give your life to Him as He gave His life for you. Ask Him to forgive you and be your Savior. If you want to do that today, you can do it. Whatever you need you might have, whatever thing you might want to pray for, we'll be willing to do so right now if you'll just stand. Anyone need to come? Come on. Everybody stand right where you are. If you need to come, come on down right now. to thank you, begin to praise him. There's none like you, none like you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's no one like you. Oh, we praise you. Anyone else need to come? Thank you for that. God, we thank you for that truth, Lord, that you change everything. God, we thank you for this word. God, we ask that you would use it in our hearts to continue changing us, refining us, Father God. We ask that you would send us out this week with this word in our minds and in our hearts. Help us share it with somebody. Help us invite somebody next week. God, we love you. We thank you for your goodness in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give him some praise in this room. What an exciting day. What an incredible word, man. I'm so excited about it. Hey, real quick, just a reminder, if you're new or even if you're not, our pastors would love to meet you, hang out with you over at the info center through the double doors to your left. They're over there right now waiting for you to get to know you. We'll see you next week.